जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारी जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारी गोपी जान बल्ला किरीट बर गोपी जान बल्ला गिरीट बर यशोद नंदन ब्रज जन रंजना यशोद नंदन ब्रज जन रंजना मुन तेरा वन यमुन थेरा वन चारी जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारी हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्णा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्णा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्णा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे प्रेमानंदे ओम नमो भागवते वसुदेवा ओम नमो भागवते वसुदेवा ओम नमो भगवते वसुदेवा
Narayanam Namaskrityam Naram Chaiva Narotamam Devim Sarasatim Vyasam Tato Jaya Mudirayat Nasta Prayeshu Vabhadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Nasti Bhaktir Bhavati Naishtaki We're reading Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 11, Chapter 2, Text Number 35. Yan Astaya Naro Rajan Na Pramadhyeta Karhechit Davan Nemuya Vannetre Naskalena patet iha Yanastaya naro rajan Na pramadyeta karhechit Davan neumilya vanitre Naskale napatet iha Yanastaya naro rajan Na pramadyeta karhechit Davan neumilya vanitre Naskale napatet iha Yan Which means Astaya Accepting Nara A man Rajan O king Na pramadyeta is not bewildered. Karechit ever. Davan running. Nimilya closing. Va or netre his eyes. Naskalet will not trip. Napatet will not fall. Iha on this path. Translation O King, one who accepts this process of devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead will never blunder on his path in this world. Even while running with eyes closed, he will never trip or fall. There's a long purport here to this verse. We'll read some of it. According to Sridhar Swami, the word anjya, easily, which is used in the previous verse, is explained in this verse. He states, Anja paden noktam sakaratvam vivrinoti. By the word anja, the ease of performing bhakti yoga is established, and this will be elaborated in the present verse. In Bhagavad Gita 9.2, the Lord himself states, Pratyakshavagamam dharmyam susukam kirtam avyayam. The process of devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead is eternal, and it is very joyfully and naturally performed. 
Srila Prabhupada comments, the process of devotional service is a very happy one. Why? Devotional service consists of Shravanam Kirtanam Vishnu. So one can simply hear the chanting of the glories of the Lord or can attend philosophical lectures on transcendental knowledge given by authorized acharyas. Simply by sitting, one can learn and then one can eat the remnants of the food offered to God. Nice palatable dishes. In every state, devotional service is joyful. One can execute devotional service even in the most poverty-stricken condition. The Lord says, Patram Pushpampalam. He is ready to accept from the devotee any kind of offering, never mind what. Even a leaf, a flower, a bit of fruit, or a little water, which are all available in every part of the world, can be offered by any person, regardless of social position, and will be accepted if offered with love. There are many instances of this in history. Simply by tasting the talasi leaves offered to the lotus feet of the Lord, great sages like Sanat Kumar became great devotees. Therefore, the devotional process is very nice and it can be executed in a happy mood. God accepts only the love with which things are offered to him. The essential point to be understood here is that when a living entity surrenders to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he tells the Lord, My dear Lord, although I am most sinful and unqualified and for so long have been trying to forget you, now I am taking shelter at your lotus feet. From this day on, I am yours. Whatever I possess, my body, mind, words, family, riches, I am now offering at your lotus feet. Please do with me as you like. The Supreme Lord Krishna has repeatedly given assurance in Bhagavad Gita that he will protect and redeem such a surrendered living entity, bringing him back home, back to Godhead, for an eternal life in the Lord's own kingdom. Thus the qualification of surrendering to the Lord is so great and spiritually potent that even if a surrendered soul is deficient in other aspects of pious life, his elevated status is protected by the Lord himself. In other processes, however, such as yoga, because one depends upon his own determination and intelligence and does not actually seek shelter of the Lord, one is subject to fall at any moment. Being protected only by one's own flimsy, limited potency. Therefore, as stated in Srimad Bhagavatam 10.2.32, Arora Krishrena Parampadam Tata Patanti Addo Nadreta Yasmadangraya. If one gives up the shelter of the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord and instead tries to advance in the yoga process, by one's own determination, or if one tries to make progress in knowledge by one's own speculative power, surely one will eventually fall again to a mediocre material platform, having no protection 
other than one's own fallible strength. Therefore, the Vaishnava Acharyas, in their commentaries on this verse, have illustrated in various ways the vast superiority of bhakti yoga or pure devotional service. In this connection, Sridhar Swami states, even if running with both eyes closed, a devotee on the path of Bhagavad Dharma will not stumble. Closing one's eyes refers to being in ignorance of standard literature. As it is said, Shruti and Smriti scriptures are the two eyes of the Brahmanas. Lacking one of them, a Brahmana is half blind, and deprived of both, he is considered completely blind. In Bhagavad Gita 10.10-11, 10 to 11, the Lord has clearly stated that even if a devotee is lacking in Vedic knowledge or ignorant of Vaisnava literature, the Lord personally enlightens him from within his heart if the devotee is actually engaged in loving service to the Lord. In this connection, Srila Prabhupada states, when Lord Chaitanya was in Benares promulgating the chanting of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, thousands of people were following him. Prakashananda, a very influential and learned scholar in Benares at that time, derided Lord Chaitanya for being a sentimentalist. Sometimes philosophers criticize the devotees because they think that most, most of, <coughs> most of devotees are in the, <coughs> excuse me, most of the devotees are in darkness of ignorance and are philosophically naive sentimentalists. Actually, that is not the fact. There are very, very learned scholars who have put forward the philosophy of devotion. But even if a devotee does not take advantage of their literatures or of his spiritual master, if he is sincere in his devotional service, he is helped by Krishna, himself within his heart. So the sincere devotee engaged in Krishna consciousness cannot be without knowledge. The only qualification is that one carry out devotional service in full Krishna consciousness. Yet this facility given by the Lord cannot justify unauthorized concoctions put forward about the process of devotional service. In the name of spontaneous devotion, in this connection, Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur has stated, Vagabhat prapti artam pratan marga karanam twati dushanavakam eva. If one manufactures his own process of devotional service, for the sake of attaining the Supreme Lord, such a concoction will cause total ruination. Srila Vishwanath Chakravati goes on to quote, Shruti Smriti Puranadi Pancharatriki Vidimbinam Aikantiki Harer Bhaktiya Utpatayaiva Kaupate. If one so called unalloyed devotion to Lord Hari does not take into account the regulations of the Shruti, Smriti, Puranas, and Pancharatra, it is nothing more than a disturbance to society. In other words, even if one is not learned in the Vedic literature, if he is engaged in the loving service of the Lord, he is to be accepted as a pure devotee. Nonetheless, such loving devotion cannot in any way 
contradict the injunctions of revealed scriptures. Omagyana timarandas yagyananjana shalakaya chaksuran militanyena tasmai shri gurave namaha vanchakaupatarubhyascha kripa sindhu bhai evacha patitanam pavani bhyo vaishnavibhyo namo namaha Translation again, O King, one who accepts this process of devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead will never blunder on his path in this world. Even while running with eyes closed, he will never trip or fall. So this is one of the very powerful verses from the Srimad Bhagavatam, and you can understand from the purport how the, the, this verse is glorifying the process of bhakti yoga. That bhakti yoga is the culmination of the yoga ladder. From the Bhagavad Gita, in the first six chapters, Lord Krishna has described the different processes of yoga and at the end of the sixth chapter, he has stated, Yogi nam api sarvesham madgatein antaratmanam shradavan bhajate yomam sami yuta tamomata. That out, out of all yogis, the one who is engaged in my devotional service, thinking of me within himself, then he is considered the highest, the best of all yogis. So there is a connection between the different processes of yoga and it's clearly stated by Lord Krishna that bhakti yoga is the culmination of the yoga practice. And here in this verse we are hearing it's a kavi, one of the nine yogendras instructing Maharaj Nimi. Nimiraj, the king of Videha. So the nine Yogendras, they were the sons of Lord Rishavdev. Lord Rishavdev had 100 sons, chief of which was Bharat, after whom this planet Earth is named as Bharat Vars. So the nine Yogendras were all Mahabhagavat devotees. He had 100 sons, nine of them were Bhagavat preachers, and they traveled the world preaching the message of Bhagavatam, describing the process of devotional service. So they had come to the kingdom of uh, Videha, and they'd met the king, Maharaj Nimi, and he was a very uh, good student. He was anxious to inquire from them. And he put questions, and these questions are the subject matter here in this 11th canto. Many different points are made. Later on, it will be described about the, the Lord's incarnations in the Kali Yuga. And it particularly mentions not only Kali Yuga, but the Lord's incarnations in each age. And there it's mentioned how in the Kali Yuga, the Lord would come and perform the Sankirtan movement, and that his color would not be blackish, that, but although he is Krishna, he would be a different color. Krishna varnam tavish akrishnam sangapangarsta parshadam yagnaye sankirtan praye yajantihi sumedasaha. So this verse was quoted by one of the Na Maharaj uh, Karabhajana Muni, one of the nine Yogendras spoke it to Nimiraj, but here uh, Kavi is speaking to Maharaj Nimi and he's describing to him the glory of devotional service. The difference between devotional service and other yoga processes. Other people, you know, before coming to Krishna consciousness, we may have been considering whether or not we should take up bhakti yoga. Is this, the, is this going to be the right process? Is this the best process? So 
Kavi is describing to Nimiraj here the supreme position of bhakti over all other processes. And he describes here, uh, while running with eyes closed. Now, of course, you try to run with your eyes closed. Did you ever try to do that? Not very easy thing to do, you know. You don't see too many blind people running. So, but here it says, if you run with your eyes closed, you will never trip or fall. And of course, the purport explains what is meant when he talks about eyes closed. That, I mean, you don't know the scriptures. There are two main divisions of scriptural knowledge. We have the Shruti and the Smriti. The Shruti being the four Vedas. So the Jnanis, they're very much in touch with the four Vedas. They follow the Shruti. We, of course, in the Shruti, there are also the Upanishads, and our Sri Ishupanishad is from the Shruti. But Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam is not Shruti, that is Smriti. So one eye is for the Shruti, one eye is for the Smriti. And in the purport, it describes if you, ha if you don't know Shruti, then it's one eye is closed. And if you don't know Smriti, then the other eye is closed. So in our Krishna consciousness movement, we, l we are learning both because Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, teaching us the Smriti, and we are learning the Shruti also. We have our Ishopanishad book, which is uh, from the Shruti, and it's the main Upanishad, the most important of the Upanishads. You don't find too many commentaries on the other Upanishads. So we have knowledge of both of these things. And when we are make, meeting people, uh, sometimes we will be challenged. Just like one time, one of our devotees, uh, His Holiness Ridayananda Goswami, was representing our Krishna consciousness movement and he was asked to give a talk to a number of Sanskrit scholars. So the Sanskrit scholars generally they only follow the Shruti and they're not very, they're not very much eager to hear Smriti. They're generally Jnanis and means also Mayavadis impersonalist. So, Ridayananda Maharaj was asked to give a talk and he spoke, quoting some verses from Bhagavad Gita. And when, of course, some of, when the professors heard Bhagavad Gita, they didn't take it very seriously because they don't accept Bhagavad Gita. And if you just present Bhagavad Gita to these kind of people, they will reject it. But as he went on talking, then he introduced some verses from the Upanishads. And particularly one verse, which is very important in preaching Krishna consciousness. He quoted one verse from the Upanishads, which states, Nityo Nityanam Chaitananas Chaitananam Eko Bahunam Yovidati Kaman. And when he quoted this verse, then the scholars, the professors were, oh, oh, they, they were very agitated. Why, why is quoting this, you know? They became very, very disturbed because they could understand he was defeating their speculative understanding. Because this verse clearly states that everything is not one. These professors were all Mayavadis. They were all impersonalists and they were thinking everything is one. But when he quoted this verse from the Upanishads, it clearly states that everything is not one. Because it says, amongst all eternals, 
There is one supreme eternal being. And amongst all conscious beings, there is one supreme conscious being. And that one supreme Lord is providing the needs of all others. He's maintaining everyone. So it's a very important verse in presenting the Vaishnava philosophy. Because in Vaishnavism, it clearly describes that there's one Supreme Lord and everyone else is his servants. And this is directly against the, the, the speculations of the Gyanis, the, the so-called professors and so on. They know Sanskrit and they can recite nicely Sanskrit mantras and so on. But they speculate about the conclusion of the scriptures. They don't have the shelter of Lord Krishna. And so ultimately, they will fail in their attempts. And we quote the verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam, as it was mentioned in the purport, Arora Krishrena patam tatantada patanti adho nidreta yasmadangraya. They will fall down because their intelligence, although they are intelligent materially, they are not spiritually intelligent. Their, their intelligence is still contaminated by their speculative understanding. They try to understand the, the Supreme by the strength of their own mind. What can we understand with our limited senses and mind? Certainly it will be limited. We cannot expect to understand the Supreme Lord simply by the strength of our own mind and intelligence. Whatever we understand, it will always be limited and imperfect. But if we want to understand the absolute truth, we have to hear, and the process is to receive transcendental knowledge. There are two processes. There is ascending knowledge and descending knowledge. If you try to get knowledge by the ascending process, it's a lot of trouble. Prabhupada gives a very clear example. He said, just like the young boy wants to know who is his father. So he can go to so many ladies, he can go to so many men rather, he can go to so many men and say, are you my father, are you my father, are you my father? And in this way he will labor very hard, he may never find his father. But if he simply goes to the mother, then the mother can immediately say, who is the father? So this way we understand descending knowledge is easy and practical for us. We want to take the advantage of something which is easy and practical. The other process, ascending process, is a lot of trouble and very difficult. Very rarely the jnanis become perfect. Bhagavad Gita also says, uh, after many births and deaths, one who is actually in knowledge, he will understand Vasudev Sarvamiti Samahatma Sadurlabaha. And this is the, the goal of knowledge. The goal of knowledge is to understand Vasudev Sarvamiti. But such a soul, such a Mahatma is very rare. But if they will take to the process of bhakti, very quickly they can make progress. One doesn't have to be a great scholar. We just simply have to engage in the service of Lord Krishna. And we actually have seen in the course of the Krishna consciousness movement, how devotees have come from so many different kinds of backgrounds and taken up Krishna consciousness and they could leave the body in a glorious circumstance. 
if we go to Mayapur in Rajapur at the Jagannath Mandir there, you can see there's a Pushpa Samadhi of Jayananda Thakur. Jayananda Prabhu was an early disciple of Srila Prabhupada. And he had graduated from university, but he took a simple job as a taxi driver. And he was driving taxi during the day, but he was also, he became a devotee, became a devotee in the very beginning of our Krishna consciousness movement. And he gave Prabhupada $5,000, which was a lot of money in 1960s. He gave it to Prabhupada to print the Nectar of Devotion book. So Srila Prabhupada appreciated that, that he made that sacrifice, contributing this hard-earned money to allow Srila Prabhupada to print his book. And Jayananda, he, somehow he contacted leukemia and he was leaving the body and he could have bought medicine to help him uh, with the pain, but he said, I don't want to waste the money on my useless body. And he just tolerated the pain. And he said, better take the money and give it to Prabhupada for the service of Krishna. And so like this, he, he was such a great soul. And Prabhupada said that definitely he's gone back to Godhead. So his Puspa Samadhi is there in Rajapur, the Jagannath Mandir. He was a very ordinary American man. He, you know, he was not brought up in the Vedic culture, but he took to Krishna consciousness. And in a few years, he left the body in 1977. He became a devotee in 1967. So for 10 years, he was engaged in Krishna consciousness. But Prabhupada said he went back to Godhead. So some people go back to Godhead very quickly. Some people take more time. Sukadev Goswami had seven days to prepare. He was very serious. Uh, not Sukadev, Maharaj Parikshit, of course. Maharaj Parikshit, when he was cursed, he had seven days. So he gave up eating and drinking and he simply heard Srimad Bhagavatam. M Sukadeva Goswami wants to encourage Maharaj Parikshit because Maharaj Parikshit may have been thinking, I only have seven days, I don't have much time to prepare. So Sukadeva Goswami wants to encourage him that you don't need a lot of time. And he gives the example about Katvanga Maharaj. The Katvanga Maharaj, was he had been fighting for the demigods against the demons. And after some time, Kartikeya came to take his place. So the demigods told Katvanga, you can take a rest now, you can stop. And they said, we are so thankful to you for helping us. We will give you benediction. So he said, just tell me, how long do I have left in this world? And the devas told him, you have one moment left. So one moment on the heavenly planets was a bit longer on the earth. He immediately came back to the earth and he sat in meditation. He fixed his mind on the lotus feet of the Lord, and he went back to Godhead. So Sukadeva Goswami encourages Maharaj Parikshit in this way, that even if you have a moment, if you're very dedicated and very serious, and you take complete shelter of Krishna, then definitely you can go back to Godhead. And Srila Prabhupada also told the devotees, just simply follow four principles and chant every day your rounds, at least 16 rounds, then certainly you will go back to Godhead. Srila Prabhupada promised the devotees this. Srila Prabhupada has that power of attorney on behalf of the Lord that he can bring us back to Krishna. So we take full shelter of our spiritual teacher 
and we try wholeheartedly to engage in devotional service. We need to be active in the service of Krishna. It's not so much the, what we're giving to Krishna, but it's the attitude which we're performing the service. This point is made in the preface of the Nectar of Instruction. Srila Prabhupada writes, everything depends on the attitude of the devotee, that we have to do our activities for Krishna in that mood of loving devotion, and then these activities will be accepted by Krishna. It is not so much the offering, but it's how we're offering it. A nice example in this regard is Duryodhan. Duryodhan had prepared elaborate foodstuffs to offer to Lord Krishna. And he used the best ghee and the, he had so many nice dishes prepared. But Lord Krishna knew the thinking of Duryodhan, that Duryodhan is not his devotee. And when Duryodhana invited Krishna to come and eat some of the foodstuffs which he'd had prepared, Krishna said, no, no, I'm not hungry today. I'm, I have no appetite. But when Vidura invited Lord Krishna to come, because Vidura is very devoted to Lord Krishna, Lord Krishna immediately accepted. But of course, Vidura was in so much ecstasy that Lord Krishna is coming to his home that Vidura only has some bananas to offer. And then by mistake, he threw the bananas away and offered the banana skins to Krishna. But Krishna did not think, oh, this is the banana skin. Krishna was so happy, he thought, he's offering to me, I should eat. So this is how Lord Krishna recognizes the, the mood of the devotee. It's so important that we do that service with the right mood. It's not that we know a lot or we're a big scholar or we're a great pundit, but it's the devotion which is important. So when Srila Prabhupada introduced us to deity worship, he was always like that. He did not give us so much uh, in attention to different mantras and rules and regulations and so on. But he said, important thing is the devotion, the mood in which you're performing, that we're doing these activities for the pleasure of Krishna. Even though we may be very unqualified materially, but because we have that mood that we want to serve Krishna, we want to do something for Krishna's pleasure. That is the important aspect of devotional service. And this point is being made here in this verse. And the purport also then goes on to elaborate and talk about how some people they take advantage of that point and they think, well, Krishna's telling me to do these things. Just like we had, there was this one lady in one country where I travel, there was what, this one lady, she saw how we were preaching Krishna consciousness and she decided she wanted to do her own thing, her own way. And so she wrote a book and then she said, Krishna told me, Bhagavad Gita is too old. We need a new book. He said, Krishna told me to do it. And like this, and it was totally nonsense, speculations. There was nothing based on any Shastra. It did not follow Sadhu Shastra or Guru. There was no Parampara. It was just simply nonsense, garbage which she was writing. But somehow she attracted so many people. People want to be cheated. And somebody comes along, they're very gullible. They're easily taken in. So we try to present the truth, but it, 
the truth must be according to Sadhu, Shastra and Guru. In the purport, the, uh, our commentators have quoted the verse that if you perform devotional service, which is not in relation to the Shruti or the Smriti or the Puranas or the Pancharatriki, then it is simply a disturbance in society. It just simply disturbs society, disturbs the faith of the people who are following strictly, creates so much disturbance that they present some nonsense philosophy full of their own ideas and speculations. And it just simply creates turmoil and confusion in the minds of innocent people. So we have to become strong, we have to become fixed in our Krishna conscious philosophy. That is why it's very important for us to read Prabhupada's books regularly and know what is the philosophy. Then we will not be tricked. If, unless we read regularly, then we will not know what is this real path of devotion. And we will never appreciate the, how fortunate we are to come to Krishna consciousness. So it's very important verse here, which we have been reading. Uh, the verse was given to me by the organizers. They asked me to speak on this verse. It's a very, very good verse. You often find it referred to by the Acharyas and describing that the supreme benefit of bhakti yoga that we have Lord Krishna to help us in everything. Just like Prabhupada said one time, he said, you can bring anyone to me and I will answer them. I will answer their questions. He said, because Krishna will tell me. So Prabhupada had that faith that Lord Krishna is going to help. Teisham satata yuktanam bhajatam priti purvakam dadami buddhi yogam tam yena mamupayanti te. To those who are constantly devoted and worship me with love, I give the understanding by which they may come to me. So Lord Krishna helps the devotee. Because if we are properly devoted, if we are really trying our best to want to serve him, then Lord Krishna will help us to go back to him. Of course, we have to be genuine in our efforts to cultivate Krishna consciousness. We have to put aside all the nonsense. We have to put away all of our material desires. And we have to simply want to be Krishna conscious. So we can see coming here to this place for the weekend, we had an opportunity for a lot of Krishna conscious association, a lot of Krishna conscious activities, and we could do a lot of hearing and chanting, which are so important for us in Krishna consciousness. So we're very grateful to the organizers that they could take so much trouble and could we thank all of the devotees also for coming and participating in this wonderful event here to over the weekend. We have a lot of things to do. We have a lot of activities going on in our own centers and it's difficult sometimes to detach ourselves from other activities, but I think everyone who has come here has received a lot of benefit and is highly appreciative of everything which has taken place. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes, Prabhu. Just take the mic, yeah. We at Iskon Kuala Lumpur, we operate two booths. 
one is typosol and one is uh, dipoli cannibal we distribute books prapupada books i'm sorry i i can understand what is thing we're offering what no we we operate two booth during dipoli and uh, typosol in kuala lumpur aha uh -huh. where we distribute prabhupada books bhagavad gita shrimad bhagavatam and all the books prabhupada books okay during one of my, i had one experience when i was distributing one of the guy from gujarati is a lawyer by profession a punjabi the so called the punjabi in malaysia we can identify them he came to our booth so i was giving him a bhagavad gita i gave him a bhagavad gita i said it's a very good book why don't you read it he said he heard about the bhagavad gita no doubt of that but according to him they surrendered to guru nana so when they surrendered to guru whatever the guru says they listen so they don't have to go higher authorities of supreme whereas in iskon we are emphasizing that bhakti yoga should follow to supreme lord and of course guru play a guru plays a part in between the parmatma and atma now what shall we how shall we uh, uh, identify that he is more concerned guru than parmatma he is more concerned with the guru with the guru uh, than parmatma who was who was the guru come again what was the guru guru nana guru, guru nana. nanak the punjabis they pray to sikh. guru nana yeah yeah sikh yeah so they surrendered to guru nana so yeah. they don't have to pray to any other god demi gods or supreme gods so guru plays a very important role between the parmatma and atma so uh, how shall we uh how can we convince them i mean we have to explain to them yes <coughs> thank you guru yes so prabhu is saying there's some people they only listen to the guru they don't worship the lord and they don't well they have the shastra but the shastra is from the guru right the shastra Guru Nana. Yes, right. They have the book. The only book is from their guru, so they only hear from the guru. They don't hear from anyone else. They don't have any uh, deity. They don't worship God. Well, in other words, they're impersonalists, right? <laughs> Because they only follow the guru. They don't worship God. They just follow the guru. So. uh they're not going to get the mercy of the lord they have the shelter of their guru actually if you if you know guru nanak the guru nanak actually tells people to chant the holy name the the in the granth sahib the book of the guru nanak it actually talks about chanting the holy name and they're encouraged to chant the holy name but they don't do it uh it it it's even said lord chaitanya but he was on the planet at the same time as guru nanak and one devotee wrote an article one time where he described that he said that lord chaitanya had met guru nanak or guru nanak had met him some there was something about it some meeting but what happens is in course of time people talk about following the guru but they just take the parts they like they don't follow everything the guru taught you know they're supposed to worship follow the guru but the guru also tells them to worship the lord just like one of the gurus there in, in the sikh religion is guru govind singh so his name is govind <laughs> you know it's the name of the lord he, they use the name govind so we want to convince people to understand there's not just only 
guru, but there's also sadhus and shastra. And, and you have to have a check on what the guru is teaching. If we don't check what the guru teaches, then you can be easily misled. So, if we have also shastra to support it, and then also other sadhus, then you can, just like in the Bhagavad Gita, in the thirteenth chapter, Lord Krishna is explaining an important point to Arjuna to understand whether or not there's oneness or duality. And so Lord Krishna states that according to the Vedanta Sutra, Lord Krishna mentions Vedanta Sutra, that this, he said this point is explained in the Vedanta Sutra and is also presented by the previous great sages also. And then Arjuna also, when he accepts Krishna, Arjuna also says, it's not, he's not accepting Krishna just himself, but he said, not only do I accept Krishna, but Asita, Devala, Vyasa, Narada, they have all seen this and they all accept Krishna also. So Arjuna is not just simply basing everything on Lord Krishna's words. Lord Krishna said he is the supreme truth. But Lord Krish, uh, Arjuna understood that so many great sages, they also accepted that, uh, that Krishna was the supreme truth. And he, uh, this is stated in the Bhagavad Gita, that there are other authorities, not just one authority. They, they say absolute power, power corrupts and absolute power com corrupts absolutely. So there's always a danger of corruption if you put everything onto, just like we say, if you put all your eggs in one basket, you know. So eggs are fragile, they can easily be broken. So if you base everything on one person, it's very dangerous. And that is why in our Krishna consciousness movement, we have parampara. We don't just base everything only on Prabhupada, but we have also the Acharyas and we have the Shastra. We're not just saying only Guru. If you just have only Guru, then you're missing what is actually being taught by the Shastra. And the Shastra, you have Vedic knowledge, it is, you know, that knowledge is given from the beginning of the creation. You have so much scriptural knowledge there, and we have so many saintly persons. Are you just going to disregard every saintly person? You don't accept any Shastra, and you only take one man, and you base everything on him. That is not very logical, it's not very safe. You can easily be misled. If you just have only the Guru, how do you check what the guru is teaching? You want to check what, the, what is being taught to us. And that is why Shastra is important and that is why sadhus are also important. We have to hear from other people, what do they say? So other sadhus, saintly persons, they say Krishna is the supreme truth. Great say, Asita, Devala, Narada, Vyas, they all say Krishna is the supreme truth. Arjuna said, now I am also accepting this. And we read from other scriptures, from based on scriptural evidence. Someone was asking yesterday how to understand Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the supreme personality of Godhead. So we have Shastra, we have Shastric evidence. Srimad Bhagavatam, 11th canto, Karabhajana Muni says to Nam Maharaj Nimi that Krishna comes in the Kali Yuga to establish the Sankirtan movement. And it's also stated in the Mahabharata. In the Mahabharata it also describes how the Lord will come in a golden color and in his early life he'll be a householder. Later on he will renounce everything and he will be peaceful and he will vanish 
the impersonal philosophy by his teaching. So Shastra is there to present the position of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and so many great sages are also there who follow Mahaprabhu, who present the teachings. There, were, there was great people, personalities like Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya and probably in the purport here today we heard Prakashananda Sarasati who was a very prominent person. He was the head of the Mayavadis. He was living in Benares. And he met, at first he was thinking Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is a sentimentalist. But when he met Lord Chaitanya, and when he heard from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, then he also chanted Hare Krishna. He also began to chant Hare Krishna. He took up Krishna con and Lord Chaitanya even took prasadam with him. Although Lord Chaitanya usually never associated with the Mayavadis, he never met with them, but after this time, because they, they chanted Hare Krishna, so then Lord Chaitanya went, he sat with them and took prasadam with them. Because he thought, now they are Vaishnavas because they have chanted the holy name. So we see great impersonalists changing, becoming devotees. So everything can be understood, not just simply by only hearing from Guru, but we have to hear also from Shastra, and we have to hear also from sadhus, also saintly persons. So three authorities are there, uh, the, just like tracks. The tracks have to be parallel. If there's any disagreement, then something is wrong. You haven't got things right. There has to be complete agreement between sadhu, shastra and guru. And when we say shastra, what shastra? Shruti, smriti. Puranadi, Pancharatriki. These things are important. All the scriptures, the, the Vedas, the Smriti, the Puranas, and they're all explaining the absolute truth. We have to understand the message of these scriptures very carefully. So, how to understand? We don't just hear only from the Guru. We have to hear also from the sadhus, from the saintly persons. We hear from the great acharyas in the line of disciplic succession. They're all presenting the absolute truth. And it can all be understood. And there's no contradictions. If you find some contradiction, then something is wrong. So, you want to present to the, the, the Sikh gentleman. We have a number of Sikh devotees in our Krishna consciousness movement. There's one lady who's from a Sikh family and she's written books. She's an initiated disciple of Srila Gopal Krishna Goswami and she's written books about Sikhism and Vaishnavism. And she's describing about how the Sikh tradition is also connected to Vaishnavism. So you can get copies of her books. She lives in New Delhi and she's a very active preacher. She's on the internet a lot. When she goes online, thousands of people come to listen. She's a devotee. All right. Hare Krishna. So, I think we can stop now. Thank you, Maharaj. His Holiness Bhakti Vigna Vinasa Narasimha Swami Maharaj Ki. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Hare Krishna.